On this episode of the Atlas Air Guns podcast, we have on Lauren Parsons, the Ladies World Field Target Champion for 2022. We talk about her shooting career, her love for field target, and the current state of affairs in South Africa. If you like competitive shooting, this episode's for you. So I'm a eight month old now, so just be excited that you don't have kids yet because once you get into that terrain, it's all downhill after that. I'm telling you, people are selling it so not great that I don't know if I want kids. Like, I'm kind of on the fence there. So your babies are your air guns. Let's start with the best stuff. Let's start with the let's start with the ending. You won um, the world world championship ladies field target this year, 2022. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I won the. Uh, first one after COVID. It was the first one since 2019. So it was really great to win that. Um, it was very tough conditions um, in Italy. We had like 105 degrees um, out in the sun, out in an open field and stuff. So it was really, really tough. And then doing it in Day State's backyard was just fantastic. Um, there was, I was the only Red Wolf to be shooting in the competition and uh, overall i finished 20th overall so i was really really happy with my results and was that the first time in italy yes that was my first time in italy so you've been all over the world when i look on any of your profiles every week it seems like you're somewhere <laughs> new uh how many countries have you been to? um i'm 27 and i've been to 27 different countries holy cow a lot of those repeats <laughs> like you keep going to the same place um, let's see. A lot of the places in Africa I've been to more than once, you know, maybe like Lesotho or Swaziland or Botswana. Those I've been to more than once. And then I've been to England a couple of times and been to Wales a couple of times. And then I visited the States before I moved here from South Africa. Yeah. So obviously you have an accent. You're, you've gone to those <laughs> places in, in the Southern countries in Africa because you're from there. Can you tell yeah. us like where you're from and kind of the history of your life? Sure. So I am from South Africa. Um, I started field, shooting field target when I was seven years old. Uh, I wanted to go hunting because hunting is a very big and popular thing in South Africa. Um, and my dad was like, you know, maybe this firearm is a little too big for you. It was a seven by 64. And, uh, so he said, you know what, let's grab an air gun and see how you do. And I showed some real promise out in the backyard and they were like, well, you need to find something a little more structured. And at that time he got to talk to a couple of people out at a military base and they kind of started shooting air guns. And one thing led to the other and they found field target on shooting the breeze, got to talking to a couple of people and um, Nick Jenkinson and Dale Foster and Jamie, those guys flew out to South Africa and helped us get field target started in South Africa, which was really cool. So I got a big leap into it very early on. I was seven at the time. Then um, following that, we hosted the World Field Target Championships in South Africa in 2009. And I shot in that. I was a junior, but it was an amazing experience to shoot in that and meet all these people from all over the world. And People that I'm still friends with today um, continued shooting all through high school. And probably when I when I turned 18, it started to get real. Um, I started winning, you know, national championships in South Africa. I made the South African team, which for us, it's like official colors. And uh, you get to represent your country, your informal clothing and stuff like that. So it's really cool. Um, travel with the the team to New Zealand for the first time. And it kind of just took off from there. Um, and then after that, I finished my degree in uh, agricultural animal sciences, decided to move out to the States and continue shooting when I, when I got here. Yeah. So which part of South Africa did you grow up in? I grew up in Pretoria. So in the city. In the city. And so yeah. how would you go out and shoot? Like, was there any shooting in the city or do you have to go out to the farmland? Um, so I shot in my backyard. Um, it, it's a gray area if it's allowed or not. So I would train in my backyard almost every day. Um, and I would go up to, um, there was a club called North Cliff Air Rifle Club. Um, I would go up there 
it was quite a ways away from my house, maybe an hour away. So I would drive up there after class, some maybe once or twice a week and practice there. And then we had a ton of shoots in South Africa. So I believe that the best form of practice is going to matches and um, having fun with your friends and learning from them instead of just training on your own in your backyard. And I believe that also attributes a lot to my success because I was able to shoot against people very, very frequently. So what's the rules in South Africa? Like how, how do they regulate air guns? Is it similar to England or is it a little more similar to the United States? Um, so neither it's not regulated on power, but it is regulated on caliber. So you're only allowed a 177 up to a 22 caliber, anything larger than a caliber 22 is uh, regulate is considered a firearm and you need to apply for a firearm certificate. This becomes very difficult because when you go to the police, they say, well, this is just an air gun. So they say you don't need one. But then on the flip side of the coin, the law says, well, you do need one. And you kind of get this contradicting um, result. So yeah, larger than a 22 is not really a thing in South Africa. And I never dabbled in anything larger than 177. Um, I personally shoot 177 12 foot pound. And when I came to the States and uh, I got my Red Wolf 22 cal, they sent me these pellets and I called my mom and I was like, oh my gosh, this is 25 grains. Like that's insane. And I was used to shooting 7.87 grain. So I was like, these are four times larger. Like this is just crazy. And I went to visit Air Guns of Arizona um, and they, they showed me the bush buck and I got to shoot the bush buck and I was like blown away. I was like, whoa, what is going on? And uh, that was a, that was a big moment. <laughs> I had no idea air guns could be that crazy. And that was only four years ago. So what got you, well, let me first ask this. I, as an American, when I always see the news in South Africa, it looks like the wild, wild west. I see guys with like AK-47s <laughs> walking down the street. How how do they go from the AK-47 walking down the street to regulating anything beyond 22 cal? So yeah, people are walking with AK-47s down the street. Uh, those are a lot of times security companies and stuff like that. If it's personally owned, then yeah, they have a license for that. So you should just have a license. There are different ways of attaining gun licenses. Uh, you can be a firearms like instructor. You can be a professional hunter. You can be a professional sports shooter. So it's all about the motivation that you give. Um, and that way you can, you can say, well, I need these guns for this and that reason. And a lot of times you get them. Um, it's just a little bit more red tape to go through and it takes a very long time. If you, if you go to Bass Pro and you purchase an, a, a firearm, they then keep it, you apply for the license and it could be almost a year, even longer before you get to go pick up your firearm. Wow. And you still have all your family there too, right? Yeah. My entire family is still over there. My brother, my mom, my dad, um, I moved here all alone and I'm still here just all alone. Yeah. So you, when you look at the news and you see what's happening there, is it kind of, kind of scary for your family? Yeah, it, it is scary. Um, my mom has this, we have this unwritten rule that you can call me at any time and I will always pick up the phone, but I already know when she calls me at different times, like I'm not expecting her to call me. Um, I get a really big fright and I would, you know, walk out of a situation. I might be in a meeting or something and I would tell somebody, listen, I got to take this phone call. She's not just going to call me just to gab about something, you know, and my heart always sinks just a little bit, go, oh my gosh, what happened? And yeah. then they tell me and it's like, oh, thank goodness nothing happened. But that's a very big fear of mine. I saw this video on YouTube. It's just one of those random ones that I scrolled across. And it was a these two guys were security details. I think they were carrying some cargo, probably money. And they had a whole on gunfight for like 30 minutes. These guys were chasing them, shooting out their car. And it was, it almost looked like staged, like fake, but it was 100% oh, legit. And like they killed people I, on the camera. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. my gosh. 
I know which one you're talking about because that one took the world by storm because the guy just finally said, you know what, I've had enough and I'm just going to kill them. And, yeah, and that's yeah. the problem. They, they get away and the criminals get away with it. And it's so hard to catch them. Um, funding is a huge issue in South Africa, funding um, the police force and that kind of thing due to corruption and due to the structure of the country. And therefore, you know, there's not a lot of disposable income um, around to properly train people. And so, you know, criminals might get away and everybody feels like this is just so wrong. Um, and then they decide, you know, they're going to take the law into their own hands, which is also not right, but you can understand why they do that. Yeah. So you moved from that crazy situation <laughs> to the United States. What got you the ticket to come to the United States? Like, well, how did that happen? Um, so I applied for an internship, a uh, one year internship with my degree. Um, I was supposed to be uh, working really hand in hand with a um, large stock nutritionist in Ohio. And so I moved out to a farm. Um, they kind of paid for my lodging. Um, and it was a situation where there was a lot of interns from different countries living at the farm. Um, and when I got here, I, I got to Ohio in January. Um, actually, ironically enough, tomorrow five years ago. Um, so that would be the, the 12th of January. And I got there and it was like covered in snow. And I was like, oh my gosh, what did I do? And then they told me what I was going to do. And I was basically a farmhand. I, I didn't learn anything. And it was sold as though you're going to learn a lot and you're going to experience things. Nah, you were just a farmhand feeding animals and raising pigs and stuff like that. And uh, I did that for about 10 months until I eventually begged Robert enough to give me a job. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you made that contact with Robert. And then what was your first time coming? When was your first time coming to Airguns of Arizona? So I met Larry on, mm, let's see, 4th of July weekend, right around there. Uh, he was out at a match called the Midwest Airgun Show in Ohio. And I drove uh, about three hours to go to this match. And we were the only two people not from Ohio. So they kind of squatted us together. And, you know, he said, you know, you would be great to do some work for us. I think we're going to send you a uh, an air gun to try out and stuff like that. At that point, I was still shooting my stire. And uh, lo and behold, a week later, Robert was calling me up, letting me know, hey, you know, we'd love to work with you or do something. There's, you know, we have some potential here um, and I'm going to fly you out to Air Guns of Arizona. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what? And he flew me out there uh, or out here. I went to range night. It was ridiculously hot. It was like 118 degrees, but I didn't even care. And went to range night, shot a little bit, shot the Red Wolf, was completely amazed. They put me up in the double tree and I thought, oh my gosh, this is like the fanciest hotel that I've seen in years. This was so cool. And we have fancy places in South Africa, but I just normally don't go to that. Um, and so that really impressed me. Um, I ended up shooting EBR that year as well. And he flew me out here for that. And at EBR, I kind of had the talk with him and I was like, listen, you know, it's October. I have to move back to South Africa soon. So, cause it was only a year visa, please. Is there anything we can do? And he told me, no, I'm sorry. You know, we, we're going through tough times at the company. There's nothing I can do for you. And I thought, oh no, this is going to be absolutely horrible. And a week later he called me up and said, listen, we had a little something happen. We have to, uh, what would you say to being our shipper? I said, I'll do anything, absolutely anything. And so uh, we got my visa going and he paid for my visa. Um, and then I started off as a shipper, um, moved over to the purchasing department. And then now, or I'm sorry, I moved up. I started off as a shipper, moved over to the prep department. And then shortly after that, I became the purchasing manager. Which have you liked so far? Because I know you're at the... <laughs> that position now, but did you like any of the other positions before? Is there any attributes to those that you liked? Uh, shipping, 
I didn't like very much. That's a very, very monotonous job and to ship everything correctly. And we have a guy, Josh, that does our shipping. He does a fantastic job of that. Um, and I w- applaud him, but I do miss prepping because you could shoot guns all day, every day. That was your job is go get a scope, pound it up, shoot a gun, sight it in. That's a great job. That was awesome. I love that job. So yeah, there's probably a thousand guys across the United States that would jump on that any, any right? second for, for right? That's slave epic. <laughs> That's so cool. And they're like, okay, you have to go and shoot this, you know, Rattler 357. Oh my gosh. And a customer yeah. ordered this scope and it's like, wow, you have the best job in the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you've maintained your passion for field target. And obviously you do other events. I saw you do really well. I think both years, at the last two years that I attended EBR, I saw you do really well, the speed silhouette. So it seems like you're trying to focus on that quite a bit for those <laughs> events, but you've maintained your passion for field target all these years. How long have you been shooting field target? Um, so I started when I was seven and I've continually shot field targets since then. So about 20 years now. And there's been times that I thought, ah, oh, I don't want to do field target anymore. I want to do something else. And then I go to a match again and I'm like, nope, I'm back. I love field target. So I don't know. It's always different. The, the course is never the same, no matter, even if it's your home course and they set it up on the exact same spot, the wind conditions, the temperature shifts, the the way in which you feel that day, everything is always different. It's always a challenge. Uh, it's a great experience to get outside and to meet great people. I've met some of my best friends through Field Target, and we have great times on the course as well as off the course talking about our equipment or going to lunch or something like that. So I, I absolutely love Field Target for that reason. Um, and I used to shoot with my family, you know, I shot with my dad and my brother and we kind of did it all together as a family. My mom was involved in the the admin side of things. So it was, uh, it was kind of a, a great thing to do as a family together. Every Saturday we're at a field target match. I was at the Pensacola air gun club where that, uh, bill quarters set up in Santa Rosa. And I went there a couple of days ago and I've never done field target. I filmed it a few times and there's, it's a weird dichotomy. Like on the one side you have it very lax, like everyone shows up and they're super lax. They got pillows and stuff like that. (laughs) On the flip side though, it's like very intense, but just in a weird, subtle way. And I can't really capture it on film like that, that difference. Like, yes, it is really relaxed. Like everyone's joking, but at the same time, they're really serious. Like Jerry, I think it's Jerry showed up at the field at Bill's field. And he's like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm so excited. This is the best (laughs) thing in the world. But do you get that at all? Do you feel like it's both relaxed and then like subtly really, really intense? Like people kind of get in their own little bubble and just go crazy. Well, you do because you're competing against yourself. So yeah, there's a a score and yeah, there's a winner and a loser and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you're competing against yourself. And for me, like even a monthly match, it becomes, oh my gosh, like I have one coming up on Saturday and I'm thinking, okay, I'm a little bit stressed over it because I've cleared the course one time before. So now I strive for that goal every single time. And so whenever you're at the match and you're shooting, you're like, okay, everything's going well. It's okay. It's okay. And then you miss one and you go, oh my gosh, I just missed a shot. <gasps> okay. Just don't miss any more, but don't say don't miss. Um, say I have to hit all my shots from here on forward. And you're so focused on every shot. Like that shot is going to determine if you win the world championship or not. And so when you get to world's it becomes a little bit easier. You're not so psyched out because you've mentally prepared yourself. Um, and that's also why I like to go to monthly matches is just as a, a practice and a training and stuff like that. But I do still get super excited about it. So when I went into your office, a spoiler alert, I went into your office last <laughs> month, you have like so many medals. I've never seen so many. And <laughs> I knew about your accolades before I met you because I've, I've talked to people and they've mentioned your name, like, Oh gosh, watch out for her. She's so good. And they start, you know, getting sweating, <laughs> like they're afraid of you. So how did you, um, how did you achieve all those medals? I mean, is that just the 20 year span? Is, is it, is it certain tricks that you're doing or what's, what's the trick? Let's, let's hear it. Um, well, I'm in the ladies class. So usually that's at a a little bit of a, a smaller group of people. Um, but no, all those medals are about a third of the ones that I have. 
Um, I only oh, brought well, over. There's like, there's like 50 there. So, <laughs> so you got like 150 or something crazy like that. It's, it's wild. Um, I brought over all of my national titles, uh, my log wins, and then all of the ones that I've occurred here in the United States over the last five years. Um, there's some trophies there, some special trophies. My first world champion win in 2015. Um, I also have a trophy on there from 2003, which is the one match I shot against the, the British. And yeah, 2003 was 20 years ago. So that one's always special for me. Um, and then there's a lot of different disciplines and that's what I really like about putting all my medals together is it's not necessarily all field target. I have some extreme bench rest medals on there. I have some, um, you know, just standard bench rest, some field target, some extreme field target, some, you know, it's all mixed in, but basically all things air gunning, um, I don't really shoot anything other than air guns. So it's basically all air gunning. I have seen, I think a post of you shooting a handgun before it might've been at the <laughs> Bay range or something like that. I'm, yeah. I'm a native to more Bay area. So I think I saw that post and actually read it in detail. Yeah. That was my one friend, John. He took me out shooting with his revolver for the first time and showed me how to shoot some steel plates and stuff like that. Uh, we were at a, I think it was the nationals last year. Um, I can't remember exactly when, but uh, we went over, they were having like a Hogue day and stuff like that. So John Bagakis, who lives in uh, California, he, uh, so he showed me the ropes on that. And uh, I recently got my green card. So now I'm like looking for a gun and wanting to see what this is all about. This looks like so much fun, but it's crazy expensive compared to air gun ammunition i mean holy smokes it's yeah. just a huge difference an ar-15 that's like collecting <laughs> dust because i literally don't care about it and i have friends that are kind of going the opposite direction where they're getting more and more into firearms and yeah i think they dabble in it for a little bit but then they back off and they go back to air guns yeah. it's just way more fun that and the accuracy I love their accuracy. I'm sorry. I love their accuracy. It's just insane. You know, you can get an MOA group at hundred yards and it's like, well, this is normal. This is good. And it's like in a firearm world, you know, you have to go seriously high end to, to achieve that. Yeah, definitely. So extreme field target. Let's talk about that a little bit at EBR. You were running all the boosts going up and down, doing crazy stuff. There's like a thunderstorm coming in lightning storm. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> How did you feel like it went this year compared to other years? And what 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 do you think people like about it so much? Because when I record with anyone or have talked to anyone that does extreme bench rest, it feels like to me at least that it's the most favorite event of most shooters. So let's start out with how do you think it went this year? And then we'll lead into why do you think other people like it so much? Um, yeah, this year was a fantastic year. It, it, it always is. Um, we have the field target, the extreme field target at the extreme bench rest, kind of at the same course every year, but it's different every year. Um, the wind conditions are different. The target placements are different. Um, and just the experience is different every time you go there. It's definitely the most popular event at the extreme bench rest because it fills up first and it's always the contentious point. People are always constantly wanting to get into field target. And the reason for that is I think because they're not used to shooting it all the time. Um, an extreme field target course takes some challenges to set up. You know, you need a clear line of sight for a hundred yards in a field, and then you need to roll the, the string out. And so you can pull the targets up and stuff like that. So it's a, a challenging thing to put up and then to run and uh, be out there enjoying it. So I think that's why people appreciate uh, the work that goes into it, the fact that the targets are painted nicely, and it's always a big challenge. And people love a challenge. You know, wind is a factor, ranging is a factor, your dope is a factor. So there's so many things at play, and you are kind of under pressure when you're doing it all. It's, it's a, a little bit of an adrenaline rush, you know? It's a little bit of a thrill, and you're trying to stay calm between all of this and not get flustered. It's, uh, it's really great. If we can have a successful event um, and fill up every time and have people move through smoothly, that's what it's all about. Uh, this year, I think we were only 10 minutes delayed throughout the entire day. So that's pretty impressive considering there's a lot of factors yeah. coming to play. And how many people was it? Like 80, 90, 100? 
Yeah, we only have a uh, space for 80 people, so we were full with 80 shooters. Yeah, and like like a normal field target, uh, aside from the Pensacola Club, usually when I've gone to matches, there's usually quite a bit of delays. Like they have to, you know, cease the line and go out and fix targets. The Pensacola Club meet went smoothly, like perfectly smoothly. And then EBR, the extreme field target, that was another event where I didn't, I didn't see that delay because I was probably bouncing around doing photography. Right. But it was so smooth. I was like pretty, pretty dang impressed. So yeah. I know that's the national championship and that's how you guys have ran that up. Can you speak to how extreme field target is being set up throughout the United States? So extreme field target is, uh, just been born, you know, it's like a little baby infant and, and I think it started crawling this last year. So maybe this year it might start standing up and, uh, walking slowly, but we're definitely not running. We're definitely not, uh, where, where regular field target is at all. Um, field target or extreme field target is basically starting to host more GPs. Now GPs are Grand Prix and they're encouraged um, by host clubs to host them. And that will form as part of a total or a log score. Now there are matches in, um, in Arizona, in Utah, in Texas, in Oregon. We're hoping to have one in Oklahoma. We're hoping to have one in California. Um, more information on that will probably come to light this next year and during the year. But basically what that means is every a couple of months, people have the opportunity to travel to these places and shoot some of those matches, um, incur some points and stuff like that, depending on how they finish and how the points are, are awarded. And then at the nationals, they have the opportunity, it's the nationals, but at Extreme Ventures, they have the opportunity to then um, get more points. This is all accumulated together at a percentage and you have a winner. And the winner this year won a caliber gun, cricket tactical, custom cricket tactical gun, which was absolutely fantastic. So that's yeah, that, super that exciting. Yeah, that orange one, right? Uh, yeah, this one. I think so. Yeah, I think it was orange color. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's nice. So that hopefully, nice hopefully you will have one this year. Out here in Florida. In Florida. I'm, Florida. Yeah, I'm working so hard on that. I was going to say caliber gun. Yeah, I'll take one of those. But yeah, no, um, Florida no. <laughs> is uh, definitely, I think, I think people are game to do that here. So yeah. I'm working hard on trying to get people to kind of entertain the thought. And I have to be respectful to the different clubs because I don't want to go in there and just push something on someone. So I just kind of throw the idea by them and, you know, hopefully they're, they're bite the bullet. Cause I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. If anyone does do that, they can get a lot of new shooters into field target. There's guys like me that are hunters and I'm not out there competing. I'm doing photography or I'm hunting, but if I have a high power air gun, there's that match. I could do that right. match and it might kind exactly. of pull me into the field target. And there are tons of people that shoot, uh, with high power air guns all the time, you know, there's tons of people that purchase them, that love them, that use them. So uh, I think it would be a perfect fit and encourage anybody that wants more information to reach out to either Air Guns of Arizona or Extreme Bench Rest um, or your local club and see if there's maybe a, an extreme field target match going on uh, because it is a lot of fun, like you said. So getting out of field target, because we've kind of been on that train for a good minute here, <laughs> what's your other favorite kind of competitive events that you'd like to do? Um, gosh, that's very difficult because I kind of just focus on field target. Um, I do shoot NRL 22 as well, as well as bench rest. Um, I've really started liking the bench rest just more of the, the hunter style bench rest. I don't like the precise you know, gadgets and stuff like that. So more of your extreme bench rest, um, hundred yard bench rest, 75 yard bench rest. Those are some serious challenges and I do really enjoy that. So, um, the wind is a massive factor in that. And I do like to, uh, to dabble in that a little bit. So I do shoot, uh, shoot that. And then I also enjoy NRL. Um, I haven't shot NRL that much yet and I'm still kind of learning a little bit but it is a lot of fun. I do like the different positions and how you adapt. And the thing about NRL that I like the most is it, it can be the same course and everybody plays it differently because it's how you interpret it. Um, I was just talking to somebody the other day 
And I told him, you know, the, the two gallon bucket might be one of my favorites because some really smaller people decide to sit behind the bucket, crunch down and shoot over it. And some larger people decide to go prone behind it and stuff like that. And it's just the difference in how they approach things is almost so magical because you're like, it's completely different on how they thought to, uh, to run through that. So speed, I mean, you're like kind of a speed demon when I've seen you, you didn't mention that there, (laughs) you kind of skipped over that as uh, one of your favorites. Obviously you train on it though, because you're really, really fast. Uh, yeah, I I train for about two weeks before EBR. I go, okay, maybe I need to get some some silhouettes out there and stuff like that and just go on the technique. Um, I do like that a lot. That is seriously competitive. That's so much adrenaline. And that's making me want to touch a little bit more on like three gunning and maybe consider looking at getting an AR and a shotgun and stuff like that. Um, that's possibly five years from now, Lauren, you know, not today, Lauren, but five years from now, maybe 10 years from now, Lauren, I can definitely see it going that way for sure. So this, the speed, the, what, you have three classes at EBR for mm-hmm. speed, you have yeah. like the unlimited and you have a pro class and you have a sportsman class. Yes. And what's, what's the distinction between those three for the audience? So uh, sportsman's class is kind of, if you've never placed before and you're not part of the industry, you shoot sportsman's class, you're allowed to start, you have to start with an unloaded magazine or single shot. So you can choose if you want a single load or if you want to load up a magazine once they say go and uh, start shooting. Pro class is the similar set of rules and you decide which you want to use. And um then the unlimited class or the open class is no holds barred. I think they just don't allow any full autos, but they allow semi autos. They allow a uh, fully loaded magazine, ready to go loaded. You know, when they say go, you're pulling the trigger and you're going. And what's pretty crazy is, um, so last year I shot an LCS. Uh, this year I shot a, um, a Delta Wolf, they say Delta Wolf. And so you have to cock it every time and I was quicker with my Delta Wolf than what I was with my LCS in semi-auto. Yeah. Well, the, the Delta Wolf, I mean, there's no, there's no, uh, tension on the, the cocking lever, right? Just, no. back, it's, yeah. So just instantaneous. So right. I like the little, it's, the little it's crazy change to think. that John Bagakis did. Like yeah. he added that little lever on his little pull. That's, that was pretty t- a nice touch of him. Yeah, that speed lever that he has, he's so quick. John and Tom is so fast. Like, it is just insane. I mean, they just go through it. And then Mike Bricker was a big competitor of mine as well. I mean, he was really gunning for it and uh, and pushing me pretty hard. So uh, he uh, he's also a really great competitor and super fast. So what would you recommend? So I, now we did the a couple small videos before on on uh, field target what recommendations for field targets let's get a quick recommendation for speed silhouette kind of competitions how do you train for that and what would you recommend to new shooters if they want to do speed events how do they go about that speed events i would recommend definitely an electronic rifle um, reason for that being is that you can you don't have any back tension like you were saying on that cocking lever or looking at possibly a semi-automatic option, but the problem is you have to have more than 20 shots. So that's a that's a difficult thing to uh, to contend with. Um, speed silhouette, honestly, it's better to have a gun that you just have fun with and try to be as fast as possible than to go out and get something just for speed silhouette. Um, speed silhouette is one of those things that It just happens at EBR or at large events, you know, and every large event runs it differently if they have it. Um, So it's very difficult to focus on that and just on that. Um, If you want something that you're more comfortable in doing every week or every month or something like that, get a gun for bench rest, get a gun for field target, for extreme field target, and try to be fast with it for speed silhouette, if that makes sense. It's one of those fun extra things to do, but to just focus on speed silhouette is very difficult uh, because it happens so 
unregularly, you know, it's, it's not very often that you see these matches come around. And like I said, every rule set is different. So the way you practice is different for every single one of them. They might force a magazine change or they might not allow semi-autos or they might allow larger calipers. So it's just, that's very difficult. So segueing just a little bit, you travel throughout well, throughout the world, but you also travel throughout the United States. How often are you on the road to do these competitions? Uh, it depends. Um, depends on when the matches are. Depends on how busy I am. Um, I try to hit most of the big matches that are out there, um, time permitting. So this year, I'm hoping to hit um, the Cajun Classic down in Louisiana. Obviously, here on the West Coast, it's a little bit easier to hit West Coast matches than to go all the way over to the East Coast. But I will try to get to the the Cajun Classic. I'll try to get to the, which is in April. Um, I'll try to get to the Massachusetts Air Gun Club match. That one's in June. And possibly, if I can, get to one in... Honestly, those are probably the only two other than nationals in October because, you know, world championships is in, uh, in August. There's talks of the Pyramid Air Cup happening. There's talks of RMAC obviously happening. Um, and then EBR is in October as well. So <laughs> there's my year jam packed full again. Yeah. <laughs> it I, goes quick. I finish all that EBR material and after i finished i'm like man it's been two months of doing ebr i was like I mean, <laughs> ebr is the most fun event of the year but after right. i finished it i was like thank god it's, i finally got that material kind of done <laughs> and then i was talking to a friend this week i was like man i really want ebr to come again it's only it's a good 10 months and then i was thinking 10 months that's way too soon i'm gonna have a bunch of stuff to do again <laughs> so it's kind of this crazy cycle well, but i haven't been yeah. to these other events but i'm sure they're they're fun too but the um ebr just like the first big event i attended and filmed and that was two years ago and then this last year i was there obviously again but it's it's fun seeing all the people there i think that's the most fun about it for me exactly just talking to people and everyone's exactly. just crazy so <laughs> And that's partially why I go to all these large matches, you know, all the big matches back East. I see all of my friends that I've made over the years. And a lot of these friends I made when I was still shooting for South Africa, uh, getting to see them every year at world championships. And that's also what makes me love field target that much is because I get to see my small group of friends, um, every single year and they go to worlds and it doesn't matter what what's crazy about the worlds is you're there and you're like in this little euphoria bubble and the only thing that matters is what gun are you shooting how well you shot today and can i beat you tomorrow yes or no and it's just a fun camaraderie but it doesn't matter if you have 10 dogs at home four kids if you live in a mansion if you live under a bridge if you what do you do for a living nothing matters all that matters is what you're doing at the world. And I love it. It's, it's like a clean slate every time. And I've seen some of them, you know, for the past seven years going to these matches and, and to world championships. And it's something I really missed during COVID. And I was really happy. I went in uh, 2022 and I will definitely go to South Africa this year for the world championships in 2023. I think there's a lot of hesitation and I've felt this in the past too. There's a lot of hesitation for field target because people I think identify rightly so before they go, oh dang, this is going to be really challenging. So they just don't do it. And I think that if people met people that went to field target would understand that, oh my gosh, this group of people are, they're good people. And I've been to, I think like three events now, field target events. And every time I'm blown away by how nice the people are. So I would always just encourage people to go and spectate because you'd meet the people and have a great time and probably take a little bit of that intimidation down. It definitely. Everybody is willing to help you out, willing to share their gear with you, share knowledge with you. I'm more than happy if somebody asks me on the side and range, hey, you know, teach me how to how to range or how to do this or how to do that. I'm more than happy to help anybody out. Um, and yeah, you, like you said, it is really intimidating. But more times than not, I hear people say, oh, I should have done this 10 years ago. I should have done this five years ago. I should have done this two months ago when I thought about it. And all too often you hear that. So I would encourage everybody out there, um, if you're ever thought of shooting field target or shooting any air gun for that matter, go out and shoot. It's a ton of fun. 
So field target, now we're talking about, let's say the worlds and the higher, the higher tier competitive level. There is an actual, you know, it is a sport and there is actual physical demands on your body. How do you mitigate those, de- those like extreme, I mean, you're holding a rifle for hours. If you think about it all day long, how do you mitigate that? I know you guys have a special suit. What is that called? Um, so I wear a jacket. Um, you can wear a jacket or you don't have to. It's only for support. Uh, you try to shoot, you know, sitting off of your knee and stuff like that. So just try to stay flexible. Um, for me in the past, it's been really successful, um, because the more I shoot field target, the more natural it becomes. Um, try to remain flexible, try to do some weight training if your gun feels too heavy for you. Um, and just try to get your body in a, in some form of a, a fit state, you know, you don't have to be a primo athlete or run 10 miles to, to shoot a field target match. Um, try to be able to withstand some heat and some cold because you're going to be out on the field target course for a long time. You know, uh, some of these world matches, they can last about six, seven hours. So, uh, not only physical fitness, but mental fitness and not to psych yourself out or get too flustered or get under pressure or anything like that. Just try to stay calm and you're okay. It's going to be okay. And try to do the best you can. We heard from you, your, your top three, like the 2003, the 2015, I think. And then the 2022 is like the kind of big, big championships that you, you really memorable events. What's the worst event you ever had? Like just horrible. (laughs) Everything went wrong. Let's hear that story. Um, Probably the world championships in 2009. Uh, that's going to be one of the worst times. I shot 14 out of 50 and I felt horrible. And I thought that this was going to be the worst moment of my life. Um, you know, I did very, very bad. I felt bad. I just, I felt like I was going to do nothing. And, you know, after the match, after I shot, everybody's like, oh, well, you know, you'll get them next time. And that was it. Nobody remembers it aside from me. Nobody mocks me for it or goes, oh, you know, you remember that one time you had such a bad match. So that probably stands out for me as, as probably one of the worst matches. Um, what, what went into that? Like how that happened? That Was it just psyching yourself out just, or was it wind? Yeah, I struggled with the wind. I struggled with my gear. I just struggled with everything. I felt like I wasn't prepared enough and I, I was just... I was having a hard time and come to find out everybody else was also having a hard time, but they, (laughs) we we say you have to, it it just sucks. So just embrace the suck and mitigate the suck. That's just what you have to do. You know, you have to roll with the punches and, um, and not psych yourself out mentally. Uh, that's a very important thing. And, um, you know, you just, even if you're having a bad day, have a little bit of a better day than everybody else then you'll be okay. Um, just thinking back, you know, I thought in Italy this last year, oh my gosh, it was like the worst thing ever. You know, I was missing three, four shots in a row. What was going on? So for me, that wasn't a seamless, fantastic match. Yes, I did better than everybody else in my class, but I didn't, for me, have a brilliant match. And that is still a big takeaway for me. Um, that's still like, ugh, that could be improved on and refined a little bit better and, and do a little bit better. So if you're a novice, like if you're someone like, you're someone like Tristan, that's never done it. I mean, I go to a field target match and I get a gun, let's say a red wolf and I go out there realistically, should I be like seven? Like what should the audience <laughs> kind of expect for the first time? Six, five, four, two, <laughs> Depends on the course, honestly. It could be a crazy course. It could be a super easy course. Um, expect to have fun. That's what you should expect. You shouldn't expect a score doesn't necessarily uh, correlate to how much fun you're having or how good of a day you've had or how bad of a day you've had. Um, the score is just one way of saying who hit the center paddle the most times. That's all it is, you know? Um, so don't, I would say for a novice, don't have an expectation because more than likely if you do, it's like buying a car, right? You never feel like you got a good deal. you always feel like, oh, I could have gotten a cheaper one or I could have gotten a better deal somewhere else. 
Uh, so don't have any expectations. Don't think that I should hit 20 or I should hit 15 or something like that. No, just go have fun. And the next time you go out, don't try and improve your score. Try and learn something new. Try and talk to a new person. Try to have a new experience. And that way it'll continue to remain fun for you. And, and you won't, uh, you won't be too hard on yourself, um, just based on the score. Okay, so I hear you saying seven. Seven's the magic number. I have no, no, seven not answer. seven. Not seven. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> let's go into a little bit of culture. What's your culture shocks in, in America? Because I know you've got to have some. What's oh, the weirdest gosh. things that Americans do? Like, why do you need an entire gallon of Mountain Dew at 7 a.m. in the morning? Why? Why, guys, why? I don't get it, okay? Also... I mean, I like ice, you know, being in Italy, they don't have anything ice, but why, why does the ice need to fill up the entire container? And then you have like this little bit of soda in there because you just need all of the ice in the world. That was like another culture shock to me. And, uh, just, yeah, there's fast food everywhere. Like, it's pretty crazy. It's, um, it makes it really hard to cook and it makes it really hard to want to cook because there's just so many easy options and it's so affordable. Go to McDonald's and it's like six bucks. Whoa. I can't cook a burger for six bucks. <laughs> yeah. So that's what's your big favorite thing to cook? Shock. Favorite thing to cook. Oh, gotta be steak. Hands down steak. I love steak. I'm from South Africa, uh, a meat loving country, a hunting culture. So it's got to be steak. Uh, did your dad hunt in South Africa? Yeah. This last time I went over there, uh, we went on a family hunting trip again, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I shot a blue wildebeest and a nyala, and it was a, a great time, honestly. Yes, we ate the steaks as well. <laughs> yeah. Did, did Kip get jealous of that? Oh, definitely. Yes. He loves <laughs> uh, going to South Africa and hunting down there. And does your brother into firearms or air guns, or is he just kind of outside uh, yeah. the role? Yeah, he uh, he is into air guns as well. Um, not as much as I was. Um, he loves scuba diving, and he is uh, a professional scuba diver, which is really, really cool. He gets to live by the ocean sometimes and uh, just have this free, calm life. Uh which is just great. You know, he has to worry about having sand in his bed because he got in bed with dirty feet. And it's like, there are worse things in life, dude. There are worse things yeah, in life. The, <laughs> the scariest thing for me with South Africa and water is the sharks. You have big, great whites there. I'm a surfer. Yeah. So I, I always would watch the surfing videos <laughs> in South Africa and yeah. the great whites there are like in abundance. There's a lot of them. So does yeah, your brother huge. ever come across them in underwater? Um, I don't think a great white, but we've gone shark diving before and, uh, we've gone cageless shark diving before. So it's down in Protea Banks. Um, he was quite a bit younger and I was over 18 at the stage. And, uh, they said, well, you know, all minors have to be accompanied by an adult. So my parents went, well, nope, we're not going. So Lauren, you go. Okay. You know, 18 years has been good, I, I guess. Um, so what they did is, um, we went out and they would chum the water a little bit as we were going out into the ocean. And then they would drop like this, uh, container with a lot of chum in it and stuff like that. And gave us some strict instructions to stay together. Don't fillet your arms around and stuff like that. And just try to watch. And it was intense because we just stood there and you just kind of went down the water and watched and the sharks would just eat everything. And it's like, I feel so insignificant right now, like one bite and I'm gone. That was by far one of the craziest things I've ever done. Yeah. Cause there's always the videos of the sharks eating the shark cage or biting the shark cage rather. And oh, yeah. I'm always thinking, you know, why don't they do that to the people free diving, but it must be kind of a curiosity <laughs> thing. They're nibbling at it, but I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a curiosity either. or something. My brother would know the answer to this. He loves sharks and uh, he's like an aficionado. So I, I thought it was kind of cool to dive with them. Now being a little bit older and knowing what I knew that, well, what I didn't know then, um, I probably wouldn't do it again. I, I like my life now. <laughs> so you were I'm in good. animal agriculture? 
Yes. So that's like sciences. And what made you go mm -hmm. into that field to begin with? So I wanted to be a vet. Um, and being from South Africa, they have strict quota systems there. So I had straight A's through school. I, uh, I had really, really good grades, but being my, uh, the, you know, basically my skin color and being Afrikaans and stuff, they only accept like 9% into the veterinary school there and I didn't get accepted. And so I was really bummed about it. And, uh, I said, you know, next year I'll, uh, I'll try again. So I started studying something that would be a segue into that. Um, and actually in 2015, I got accepted for veterinary sciences. I got accepted a week after I won my first world championship uh, title. So I went home and I was stuck with this conundrum, you know, do I, uh, do I give up shooting? Because you can't shoot and be a vet at the same time. It would have been impossible. I would have had to sell my gun to afford uh, a place to stay and stuff like that. You know, it would have been a, a tricky situation. Um, and, you know, agriculture, I could study agriculture and still continue shooting, still live at home and stuff like that. And so that was a very, very tough decision. Um, some of my friends, you know, chose to study a vet, study and become a vet. And I chose to continue to shoot and do animal sciences. And I was like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to do this for a little bit longer. I don't regret it ever. They just finished their degrees this last year. And I've been living in the States for four years. So it's completely different life paths. Um, I always knew that I was going to leave South Africa. It was never a shock to my parents or, or anybody that knew me. Oh my gosh. No, I was, I was always going to leave. It just depends on where I went. Right. What was the, what was kind of the inception of that feeling that you want to leave? Like what made you so determined to leave? I just liked everywhere else. And, you know, I, I saw my parents while, while I was growing up, you know, they both worked and they still both work and they, they, you know, they worked their butts off. Um, I would take a transport home and have aftercare and stuff like that because both my mom and my dad had full-time jobs. Uh, they would continue to try the best they could. And, and we were, we were okay off, you know, we weren't super well off, but we were, we were comfortable. And I thought, okay, you guys are really killing yourselves. And uh, people started talking about retirements and stuff like that. And, you know, my grandmother, she worked until she was like 72. And I always asked her, you know, why did you not retire? And she says, well, I could afford it, but not really. And that was a, big thing for me like what is your quality of life if you if you can't move forward and basically how they explained it to me was because of inflation and because of a bad economy everything just kept on going backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards and and you would never get out of the situation um and that was a big thing for me and i thought oh, is it the same way everywhere else so that was a big thing for me um then the the security is just crazy. Um, you know, we, we were trained, you know, by my parents and stuff to stay in our rooms if anything would ever happen. And there's constantly scenarios and constantly talk about, well, what happens if they break into the house? Uh, well, what happens if you get trapped in your car? What happens if somebody follows you home? And not because it's these crazy situations that we see about in movies, it happens all the time you know, meeting a friend and, and she's like, listen, I, I have to tell you something. I don't feel well about it, but I was just raped last week. It's like, oh my gosh, that is, that's horrible. Um, I went to a school briefly close to my house. The school was like 500 yards away from my house and I refused to walk. I waited like three hours after school for my mom to pick me up because I was too afraid to walk. I was just, it was a small path and we lived in a pretty good neighborhood. We didn't live in a bad neighborhood at all, but there was this one section that you had to go by and I was just deathly afraid being a girl alone walking. And I thought, you know what? This is not quality of life. This is not where I want to see my kids. Um, this is not, this is not living. This is just being. 
and I wanted to live. So I always said, you know, I would, I would leave. And I know a lot of people say, you know, here across the United States, you know, it's going really bad and stuff, but until you've lived that, I don't know, man, I don't know. It's a pretty good place that we live in here. And, uh, I, I feel very, very fortunate to be here compared to, to South Africa. Yeah, you got the American flag on your on your chest. In the office. <laughs> yeah, I like it My enough team to represent. USA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really cool. it's uh, yeah, it, it's scary. It really is. I did MMA as a kid as well, just as self defense and stuff like that. And it's constantly a fear, and it's not something. It's not cool. It's not fun. Um, I would hope to move my parents over here and stuff like that. There's a lot of people moving out of the country, and it's just for various reasons, you know, either they got a better job, um, or they want a better life for their kids, or they want a better life for their parents, but everybody has their reasons for leaving the country. Um, and the same as the States, you know, people leave here as well. Yeah. So for Arizona, what's your favorite part of Phoenix? Cause I've only recently started going there the last like three years. And I have to say, I'm really shocked by the city. It's really beautiful. It's a lot of crazy stuff going on. I went there with my wife and the kids and it's just like so much stuff to do. I was kind of overloaded. What's your favorite place to go to and favorite thing to do? Uh, my favorite thing to do is to go out to eat because I love the, the restaurants and stuff out here. Uh, my favorite place has to be the Phoenix range because I love the, the gun range out there. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And then during spring and during, uh, fall go hiking, you know, there's so many great places to go hiking, uh, take my dog for walks. The, the weather is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then when it's really hot outside, you know, most people here have a pool and you just enjoy kick back in the pool and, and relax a little bit. So summer times are, are meant for relaxing properly, which I really like, um, winter times, you know, we're all cooped up inside and it's not bad weather here. Like, you know, like in Florida, it's not horribly cold, but for us, it's still kind of chilly. Yeah. So do you do any hunting in Arizona? No, I've never gone hunting here in the States. Honestly, it seems super difficult. Like I've talked to Kip about it and to a couple people like they walk for forever. And there's a guy at our shop as well, Holden, you know, he explains and he's like, yeah, I was sitting out in the snow all weekend. I'm like, what? That is insane. You know, in South Africa, everything's camped off. So they go, okay, well, you want to go shoot some kudu? Well, they're in this area and you're going to walk a little bit and maybe you're going to hunt for a day or two, but you're going to find something here in Arizona. It's like, well, I didn't find anything all season. What? All season? Nah, I, uh, I haven't. Uh, I haven't. I moved from California to Arizona. I think most listeners know that. But in California, ironically, the one thing I have to give them credit for is their brochures for hunting for the year were kind of semi-easy. I mean, semi, not easy, but semi-easy to okay. navigate. Florida is a little different in that if you hunt a WMA, that's a wildlife management area, each one has different regulations. So you have to be very specific to that one location. So I did get to go hunting two weeks ago and I took that Brokaw concept light that David from Black Arts won at EBR. He gave it to me. I took it out and I got all situated and at like an hour and a half hike into this forest. I found this little berm. I laid down, kind of set up. I'm waiting for some animals to come out. It's getting quiet. All of a sudden, I started feeling like these violent pain all over me. It was red ants, like red ants, all over my body, like oh buying the crap gosh. out of me. And <laughs> it was really hysterical. Was I, would, I think I got it maybe on film, but I have, I'll have to check the SD card. But it was hilarious. Oh like gosh. I was like, ah, like running around. But oh I mean, that just goes to show like hunt, you never know what's going to go on with hunting here in Florida because it's literally like mosquitoes and ants and crazy bugs here getting you. I honestly feel like Florida is the Australia of the United States because everything out there seems to want to kill you. You guys have invasive pythons and invasive gators and invasive red ants and bugs and like, dang, we we have rattlesnakes here, man. But they're cool. They're they have they it's have okay. these monkeys in southern Florida too that have like an infestation of herpes and they're an invasive species. So this oh is like gosh. gross monkey on the south of Florida. That you're allowed to hunt, supposedly, but I haven't I haven't checked it out yet. Oh my gosh. And like panthers. Yeah, no. And I think there's also invasive there is one invasive crocodile that's sometimes seen in the very southern tip of Florida. 
oh my goodness, that's just crazy. I mean, aside from Louisiana where they wrestle gators, that is just absolutely insanity. Yeah. I, I, I'm very happy to be living in Arizona right now. I must say it's 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 cool out here. We don't have we don't have anything attacking <laughs> us except the so heat. How, but how, that's the only thing. How far north have you gone in Africa? Have you gone all the way to like Kenya, like all the way up there? Um, no, only to about Namibia. Um, you know, Namibia, Botswana. Uh, jumped into Zambia real quick, you know, just around the Victoria waterfalls, but just right at that, uh, never further. It gets to be really far away. I mean, that from my house, you know, it's about a 14 hour drive. So that gets to be a really long time. And it's, it's not like you're cruising down I 10, you know, it's, uh, backcountry roads for sure. <laughs> There's a lot of things to be in contention with. Have you ever seen a crocodile there? Yeah, a bunch yeah. of times. Those things terrify yeah. me. That's like Crocodiles? the animal that hunts. Yeah, they they hunt people versus like alligators, which are usually scared. Once in a while, you see a large alligator in South Carolina eat someone, like an old person or a young person. But crocodiles will hunt anyone, doesn't matter the size. They're like they they're one of I think three species on the world that actually deliberately actively hunt human beings and terrifying. Oh my gosh. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, I saw it from like a vehicle, you know, I didn't like go over and pet it or anything, but yeah, no, those aren't too scary. I mean, I've seen almost anything out there. Um, and we, we have some rehabilitation centers where you can actually touch them and play with them and like elephants, you know, you can take a picture with them or lions or cheetahs, uh, you know, there's a lot of cool things, but Nope, the animal I'm still the most afraid of is a horse because I can't trust a horse. I feel like they're always sus and they always have something going on and, you know, they have personality and you watch these movies and it's like, well, what if he goes crazy? What then? And what if he just like steps on me? They say they're like big dogs, but well, that makes you I don't like know about that. 10 times better than any other girl that I know that <laughs> likes horses because a certain type of a girl, like they're like whispering to the horse. They don't care about people. They just only talk about the horse and they. No. They I whisper to my air guns. Times a day. I talk to my air guns. Yeah, yeah there you you're go. You're a good air gun. <laughs> yes, you're accurate. Yes, you go change in my temperature was, shifts was, today. <laughs> I was going to say, you should, uh, with your accent, you could totally be like the modern day Steve Irwin and just, you know, boss with some <laughs> crocodiles. But if you do yep. that, just don't go swimming with stingrays because that's how you go out. It's not. It's not by the by the crocodile eating you, but it's no. the stingray getting you in the heart. Very unglamorous, though, right? I mean, talk yeah. about an anti. I always thought he was going like, to go down with a yeah. I thought he was going to get eaten in half by a crocodile, but nope. There's the stingray, right? Just like that. No, it was a uh, that was a crazy story. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like super sad. I was I think I was a teenager and I was really sad. I was like, oh, because I grew up watching him and. I at least deserve to see him get eaten by a crocodile, but the, <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Dang it. I feel really bad for saying that because his poor family. Anyway, well, um, I think we've come to a close here. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the Atlas Arrogance podcast. And if anyone wants to follow you, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram at parsons.lauren. And they can find me on Facebook. Um, and they can also follow the Air Guns of Arizona YouTube channel. I do um, share some knowledge over there and give some tips and tricks. And uh, if not, you can find me on the gun range because I'm literally always there. And this year, EBR, really quickly, next year, I guess, 2023, what gun are you going to be taking there? Because I know you, you keep your guns in your possession for a while before you take it. Yes, uh, probably my Day State Red Wolf. But you never know, you know, the year is young, something really fantastic might come around. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Lauren. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Atlas Air Guns podcast. Make sure to like with a five-star rating, share, and subscribe. Have a question? Email atlasairguns at gmail.com.